Hello, I'm Ruby Sweet and I'm a trustee of the Historic Towns Trust and I work at the Centre for Urban History at the University of Leicester. In this short talk, I want to do two things. First, I want to look at the longer history of interest in place, going back to the antiquaries and local historians of the 18th and 19th centuries. An antiquary was, and is, someone who's interested in any aspect of the past, especially the material past, so buildings, for example, and what we'd now call architectural history. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, the term was particularly associated with people who did local history, rather than writing the grand narratives of national or political history. Second, we'll be looking briefly at how the Historic Towns Trust today benefits from the research of these earlier antiquaries in order to create and illustrate our maps and atlases. So people have been producing one place studies, describing their local village, their town, and recording what they can find out about its history for centuries. But the practice really started to become widely established in the 18th and 19th century. There are lots of reasons for this, but a couple of the most important are, first, the sense of local pride and belonging that a lot of people, and at this time it was generally men, felt and how they identified strongly with the place in which they lived. They wanted to research the history of their towns, and very often this was also their own family's history. That satisfaction that we get from tracing back our family history or a building's history was shared by people in the 18th and 19th centuries too. The other major reason, particularly by the late 18th century, is that contemporaries were very much aware of how quickly their own towns and cities were changing as a consequence of population growth, industrialization, and commercial expansion. Older buildings were being destroyed, new developments were rising up, and the response of many people to these changes was a wish to record and to preserve what was disappearing. So this is the context in which there are lots of efforts to research and write the histories of towns and cities and to understand their development. People were using local records like corporation minutes, parish registers, manuscript diaries, for the first time to write about their own place. And in doing so, they ensured that many records were preserved that would otherwise have been lost. Now, if we take Norwich, for example, the city walls have disappeared, very little remain today, but we know the course of the walls without undertaking excavation because antiquaries in the 18th and 19th centuries recorded their course and their appearance, and because they appreciated that they were in an important part of Norwich's history, symbolizing its importance, but also because they provided evidence of urban life in earlier times. In 1720, a local antiquary and historian, John Kirkpatrick, wrote an essay describing the walls and the gateways, which were then largely standing and he illustrated this with his own drawings. If you refer to the essay on Norwich's history in our Norwich Atlas, you'll find that the section on the walls draws very heavily on Kirkpatrick. By the end of the 18th century, however, the walls had mostly disappeared, the corporation had taken down all the gateways because they were seen as old fashioned and an encumbrance to traffic. As the local newspaper put it, they were an inconvenience that smells of rank in the nose of modern improvement. But before they disappeared, however, another antiquary, William Stevenson, commissioned a local artist, John Ninham, to draw the gateways for his personal collection. Now, Kirkpatrick's drawings have mostly disappeared. Any, only a very few remain, such as this one on the slide, which shows Pockfort Gate from the north. But copies of his drawings were made in the mid 19th century by the artist Henry Ninham, son of John Ninham, who we just mentioned. And these are published in 1864. And you can see that Pockfork Gate by Henry Ninham on the left here. But his father's drawings that had been completed in the 1790s had also just been published just a few years earlier in 1861 by the Nor Norwich and Norfolk Archaeological Society. What's happening here in the 1860s is that local historians were becoming very interested in recovering a sense of what their town or place had looked like in the past, or as they called it, olden time. And thanks to their efforts, 
these very ephemeral drawings from the 18th century have been preserved, even though the gateways have disappeared. Now, Bristol in the 1830s and 1840s was growing very rapidly as a port and much of the medieval city was disappearing. But if you look at the, our Bristol map of 1480, you'll find that it includes a number of illustrations of medieval or early modern Bristol. Some of these depict familiar buildings which are still standing, valued for their historical association. But others show narrow streets, ramshackle half-timbered buildings or sections of city walls which have long since disappeared. Many of these come from what is known as the George Breckenridge Collection, which is held at Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery, and a large selection can be accessed from the Bristol Know Your Place website. Breckenridge's family had acquired immense wealth from West Indian sugar plantations, and he was able to retire on the proceeds of slavery to live outside Bristol and pursue his interests in antiquarianism and local history. He was very much aware of the changes happening in Bristol, and he commissioned a number of local artists over a 20 to 30 year period to sketch street scenes, buildings and monuments. He never published anything himself, but he kept the drawings and sketches with notes about the names of the people living in the buildings, the circumstances in which the drawing was taken, local events of interest with which they were associated, or when the building was demolished and why. His scrapbooks or albums are an invaluable source for local historians who want to understand what late medieval or early modern Bristol looked like. In York, the medieval fabric is better preserved than it is in Bristol. It didn't undergo its 19th century expansion. But even so, what we have is a fraction of what was still standing in the early 19th century. Again, we have local antiquaries and artists to thank for what we know of the appearance of medieval York. They encourage local artists to draw not just the minster and the churches, but the rather run-down, half-timbered buildings that were very unfashionable at the time and were often soon to disappear. And again, you'll find these images are widely used in the York Atlas and on the York map. And here we have a couple of examples of half-timbered buildings from Stonegate, and Goodrum Gate that were drawn in the early 19th century. And here we have Micklegate and Monkgate, both of which are still standing, but their barbicans, that's the fortified outposts to the gates, don't survive. And drawings like this are the main source that we have for what they look like. Indeed, York city walls themselves have in large part survived rather than being demolished in the name of improvement as in Norwich largely because of the efforts of local historians and antiquaries who campaigned for their preservation in the early 19th century. And it's also interesting to see that even in the early 19th century, antiquaries are making efforts to illustrate the growth of cities with historical maps. So I have here an early attempt to map Saxon Bristol from Samuel Sayer, who published his memoirs Historic historical and topographical of Bristol, in 1821. And here we have a sequence of maps showing the historical evolution of Norwich by Samuel Woodward. I like to think of these as the precursor to the work of the Historic Towns Trust, as, like Woodward, we produce maps to illustrate the sequential growth of a city. These were in fact made in the 1840s for a series of lectures for young men of Norwich's Mechanics Institute on local history. Now, we certainly wouldn't use these maps as evidence for creating our own atlases, but the important point is that people like Sayre and Woodward and their colleagues were gathering information and ensuring that historical records providing evidence about the built form of a city in earlier periods were being preserved. When we do local historical research, the fact that there are records to look at or archaeological remains that have been preserved is very often due to the efforts of these local historians and antiquaries in the past. Similarly, these people were recording the appearance of buildings that they realised would soon be lost, even if they couldn't save the buildings themselves. At the Historic Towns Trust, we draw on the latest cutting edge historical and archaeological research, but we also depend very much on a tradition of studying the history of place that goes back to the 18th century. <laughs>